Hello, um, welcome everybody and thank you for coming to uh, visit us today. Um, what I'm going to do for this taste lecture, I'll try and keep it to the, uh, the half an hour, um, is to give you a, a preview or part of a lecture that I give on the first year um, prose module um, that, that Dan's been, in, been telling you about on Virginia Woolf's long feminist essay, A Room of One's Own. Um, and it, uh, this is also a frame text for a second year theme module called Shakespeare's Sisters, which is a women's <coughs> writing module um, uh, from uh, 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 the, the sort of middle of the um, sort of 15th century up to the, the present day. Um, and Woolf is, is fascinating as a pioneer, really, of feminist literary criticism in the 20th century. She was hugely preoccupied throughout her writing with the relationship of women and fiction. Um, and the role of women in history and in the history of, of, of literature. And she, was, and she wrote continuously about the problems of women's writing, of being a woman writer herself throughout her life, in her novels, her diaries, her letters, her essays and, and, and criticism. A Room of One's Own was, was published in 1929, and it makes uh, a number of key arguments, which I've, I've summarised here, um, one thing that she focuses on is the social and economic conditions necessary for women's writing, um, the problem of a tradition of women's writing or a lack of a tradition of women's writing for women writing in the 19th and early 20th centuries to be drawing upon uh, 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 and, and setting themselves in relationship to. She talks about the concept of a female sentence, um, Wolf's idea of a style or form of writing that might particularly articulate women's voices and women's values. And finally, she turns to the ideal, and it remains an ideal, always, I think, for Wolf, of an androgynous aesthetic, the idea of um, a mode of writing in which an author can write uh, free from the, any awareness uh, or preoccupation um, uh, uh, of their sex as male or female. Um, and I'm really going to concentrate probably on the third one largely uh, for, this, um, for, for this bit of the lecture. We do all of them in, in the, the full one. So what I want to do really today is just introduce you to the style, the approach of the essay, um, and then look at what Wolf says about the possibilities for women's writing, um, particularly in the 20th century, as well as perhaps implicitly her own aims as a female novelist and as a female critic. So A Room of One's Own grew out of two lectures that Wolfe gave in 1928 to the women's colleges at Cambridge, uh, Girton and Newham. Um, Wolfe was by now the author of six novels and you could, she, could, um, uh, she, she was invited to come and talk about uh, women's writing and being a woman writer. But Wolf didn't really treat this invitation in perhaps the con conventional way um, that the scholars inviting her might expect. And she begins by refusing quite bluntly to um, give what she says she recognises is generally assumed to be uh, uh, the object of a lecture, to give, give um, a series of facts to her, reader, to her listeners, to her readers in the novel, um, uh, to scribble down and take away. And, and this is Wolf. When you asked me to speak about women and fiction, she says, I sat down on the banks of a river and began to wonder what the words meant. They might mean simply a few remarks about Fanny Burney, a few more about Jane Austen, a tribute to the Brontes and a sketch of Haworth Parsonage under snow, some witticisms, if possible, about Miss Mitford, a respectful allusion to George Eliot, a reference to Mrs Gaskell, and one would have done. But at second sight, the words seemed not so simple. The title Women in Fiction might mean, and you may have meant it to mean, women and what they are like. Or it might mean women and the fiction that they write. Or it might mean women and the fiction that is written about them. Or it might mean that somehow they all three are inextricably mixed together, and you want me to consider them in that light. But when I began to consider the subject in this last way, which seemed the most interesting, I soon saw that it had one fatal drawback. I should never be able to come to a conclusion. I should never be able to fulfil what is, I understand, the first duty of a lecturer, to hand you after an hour's discourse a nugget of pure truth to wrap up between the pages of your notebook and keep on the mantelpiece forever. 
And of course, it soon becomes clear that Wolfe is not only suspicious of so-called nuggets of truth, but also that she wants the students listening to her to do more than simply note down a few facts to regurgitate in an essay or an exam. It's worth keeping note of for university life. Women and fiction, she says, remain, as far as she's concerned, unresolved problems and continue to do so throughout her life. And she's really inviting her audience to, to join her, to engage with her um, in exploring these problems, to follow her train of thought as she researches and muses through the rest of the essay, um, pondering over the history of women's writing. And to do this, she decides to sort of divest herself of her identity as, as Virginia Woolf woman writer and take on the voice of a persona, a woman called Mary, who has been invited, like Woolf has, to give a similar lecture to a thinly disguised uh, uh, university college, Fernham, at a thinly disguised uh, university, Oxbridge, and who actually spends the whole of the rest of the essay researching and worrying about what she's going to say. And through this manner, she brings up uh, the kind of issues of the, the piece. So the essay reopens in the voice of Mary as she is sat by the river um, trying to plan the lecture. Um, she's, it's along the edge of a male college and she's thinking about what she's going to say and a thought is starting to, to form um, uh, uh, in her mind. Thoughts are always very eph ephemeral in, in Wolfe's writing. She's always sort of glimpsing, glimpsing them and chasing them and trying to, to, to capture them. So as she's thinking this thought through and what she wants to argue, she sort of gradually walks over the grass of the, the, the university. So this is, um, uh, this is the, the scene. However small it was, the thought, it had nevertheless the mysterious property of its kind. Put back into the mind, it became at once very exciting and important. And as it darted and sank and flashed hither and thither, set up such a wash and tumult of ideas that it was impossible to sit still. It was thus that I found myself walking with extreme rapidity across a grass plot. Instantly, a man's figure rose to intercept me. Nor did I at first understand that the gesticulations of a curious-looking object in a cutaway coat and evening shirt were aimed at me. His face expressed horror and indignation. Instinct rather than reason came to my help. He was a beadle, I was a woman. This was the turf, there was the path. Only the fellows and scholars are allowed here. The gravel is the place for me. What idea it had been that had sent me so audaciously trespassing, I could not now remember. The thought escapes as, uh, 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 as the, the, the female Mary <coughs> is ushered off the grass, which is only um, open to the male scholars and fellows of the college. She then decides to go into the college library to look up a manuscript, and just as she gets to the door, she is again uh, rebuffed. I was actually at the door which leads into the library itself. I must have opened it, for instantly there issued, like a guardian angel barring the way with a flutter of black gown instead of white wings, a deprecating, silvery, kindly gentleman who regretted in a low voice as he waved me back that ladies are only admitted to the library if accompanied by a fellow of the college or furnished with a letter of introduction. Mary is angry, but as she reflects that a famous library has been cursed by a woman is a matter of complete indifference to the famous library. Now, Wolfe is a very skillful essayist, and A Room of One's Own continues very much in this way, accessible, conversational in tone. It's impassioned, it's enticing to read, it's a, a, a deeply engaging piece. It comments on real woman writers, uh, Afra Ben, Jane Austen, Charlotte Bronte, for example. But it's also full of anecdotes, of, of stories, dramatised stories, satire, um, tragic characters. It's part criticism, part fiction, uh, part history, part biography, um, part autobiography. And in this way, Woolf is able to introduce quite complex theoretical feminist uh, uh, literary ideas in a way that is never alienating and also quite polemical ones in a manner that always seems self-deprecating. 
Um, but nevertheless, she was very much anticipating a negative response on the part of reviewers, um, and she awaited those reviews with considerable nervousness. She wrote in her diary, I shall be attacked for a feminist. I'm afraid it will not be taken seriously. Wolfe is very wary in a room of one's own of making any definitive assertions about women's writing, or at least in terms of its style or form. And indeed, much of the essay is taken up with her reflections on the lack of women's presence within narratives of history and the lack of women's writing over the history of English literature. And the reason she argues very overtly for this is that fiction is not the result of genius but of material circumstance. Prior to the 19th century, she argues, the demands of the domestic household, the lack of education available to women, um, and the laws that denied women um, uh, 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 ownership of funds or property made it virtually impossible for a woman to be able to write. The creative voice of women, she argues, even the most gifted women would have remained mute because of a lack of education, of support and opportunity. This economic and social and political powerlessness, she argues, um, on the part of women, then also results in centuries of cultural representation that privilege male values um, over uh, those of women and that marginalise female experience. So at this point in the essay... The, the persona of Mary, has shifted to the British Library. And she's browsing the shelves of the women's, uh, 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 of, of the British Library, looking up uh, uh, the role of women. History books, she finds, concentrate on the great movements of government, of uh, uh, scientific revolution, of war, and are dominated by the actions and values of men. Fiction, by contrast, she says, has plenty of women in it, um, but it mythologises female characters in a manner that seems to bear little relation to reality. And this is a uh, uh, wolf. Some of the most inspired words, some of the most profound thoughts in literature fall from her lips. She's talking of women characters in the plays of Shakespeare. But in real life, women could hardly read, could scarcely spell, and was the property of her husband. Um, in the seminar, you'll look at a, a longer passage uh, uh, examining uh, the, the, the lack of um, the representation of women's experience uh, uh, in uh, history. Wolf's conclusion, then, is that women need time and independence and freedom of thought if they are able to write, and that these things depend on a certain degree of financial um, security and of private space. In Wolf's shorthand, this translates to £500 a year and a room of one's own. For Wolf, however, this material basis is only the start. And here, the focus of her argument shifts from the material inequalities that limited women's opportunity to write to starting to think about the problems of forging a, uh, a, a female language or a female sentence, a female, a truly fem female mode of writing. And that's what I just want to focus on uh, uh, for the, the, the second part of, of what I'm talking about today. So Wolf goes on to argue that even if a woman has the room of one's own and the 500 pounds, okay, even uh, 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 when she has the money and independence and freedom to write, um, the problem of writing as a woman, yes, of actually creating fiction, remains. And here she seems to be suggesting that writing as a woman has different problems um, and different qualities to writing as a man. In A Room of One's Own, for example, uh, uh, she thinks about women novelists of the 19th century, such as, uh, uh, as the Brontes and George Eliot, and the struggle that they faced in writing, knowing that their works would be judged by critics accordingly, um, uh, uh, in terms of the, the cultural expectations of their gender. Okay? That women's writing would be judged sentimental or monstrous, according to the cultural expectations of how uh, 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 women should behave and should be perceived. And so Wolfe talks about how 19th century women 
often uh, uh, in, in, in their professional roles as writers, might adopt male pseudonyms like the Brontes or use their uh, uh, married name like Mrs. Gaskell. Okay. They were never, Wolfe suggests, um, really writing with the kind of freedom and confidence of their own identity as women writers. And it's only in the 20th century, in the start of the 20th century, that Wolfe thinks that women writers are beginning to mould a mode of writing that is truly expressive of their own experience and their own voice. So, previously, Wolfe argues, women have only had available to them the language of men, and this is very different in its values, experiences, and interests to that of women. It is obvious, she says, that the values of women differ very often from the values which have been made by the other sex. Naturally, this is so. Yet it is the masculine values that prevail. Speaking crudely, football and sport are important, the worship of fashion, the buying of clothes trivial. And these values are inevitably transferred from life to fiction. This is an important book, the critic assumes, because it deals with war. This is an insignificant book, because it deals with the feelings of women in a drawing room. A scene in a battlefield is more important than a scene in a shop. Everywhere, and much more subtly, the difference of value persists. The challenge, then, becomes the writing of a new kind of sentence, something that Wolfe had already been very interested in uh, uh, for a long time, even in her sort of early criticism and reviews. And in this review um, from 1920, we see her quoting the words of Bathsheba Everdeen uh, from Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding, Madding Crowd. I have the feelings of a woman, but I have only the language of men. Wolf goes on to say, from that dilemma arise infinite confusions and complications. Energy has been liberated, but into what forms is it to flow? To try the accepted, to discard the unfit, to create others which are more fitting, is a task that must be accomplished before there is freedom or achievement. So there has the woman writer has to try out the kind of old forms of, 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 of literature, of language, to find out which ones work for her and where she might need to forge or create new ones more appropriate to her values, to her experience, her voice. And I think this is really Wolfe's sort of feminist manifesto. Once women have achieved independence, a right to property, education, their own money, how do they fashion a life, a voice that is true to their own sex and isn't just mod modelled on a status quo that has been developed over centuries uh, in accordance to the lives and voices of men? And it's a task that we might think Wolf sets herself as a novelist. In her very first novel, The Voyage Out, um, Terence Hewitt, a writer, one of the, 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 the characters... Um, in the, uh, 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 in the novel, imagines writing a novel about the private lives of women. I've often walked about the streets where people live all in a row, and one house is exactly like another house, and wondered what on earth the women were doing inside, he said. Just consider, it's the beginning of the 20th century, and until a few years ago, no woman had ever come out by herself and said things at all. There it was, going on in the background for all these thousands of years, this curious, silent, unrepresented life. Of course, we're always writing about women, abusing them or jeering at them or worshipping them, but it's never come from women in themselves. I believe we still don't know in the least how they live or what they feel or what they do precisely. In a room of one's own, uh, uh, towards the, the, coming, as we come towards the end of the essay, um, the persona of Mary picks up a novel by an imaginary 20th century woman writer called Mary Carmichael. And she's struck to find that it seems predominantly about relationships between women and about the minutiae of their daily life. And talking about the, the novel, she says, it ranged very subtly and curiously amongst almost unknown or unrecorded things. It lighted on small things and showed, them, showed that perhaps they were not so small after all. It brought buried things to light, 
and made one wonder what the need had been to bury them. Wolf is very interested in uh, 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 the work of, of, of this imaginary writer. She continues reading, I wanted to see how Mary Carmichael set to work to catch those unrecorded gestures, those unsaid or half-said words, which form themselves no more palpably than the shadows of moths on the ceiling when women are alone, unlit by the capricious and coloured light of the other sex. Thinking about the everyday life of London around her, she imagine, imagines herself in conversation with Mary Carmichael. And it encourages her to write the lives of women and uh, uh, the sort of 20th, early 20th century women as they really are. And so she imagines walking with Mary through London. All these infinitely obscure lives remain to be recorded, I said addressing Mary Carmichael as if she were present, and went on in thought through the streets of London, feeling in imagination the pressure of dumbness, the accumulation of unrecorded life, whether from the women at street corners with their arms akimbo and the rings embedded in their fat, swollen fingers, talking with a gesticulation like the swing of Shakespeare's words, or from the violet sellers and match sellers and old crones stationed under doorways, or from drifting girls whose faces, like waves in sun and cloud, signal the coming of men and women and the flickering lights of shop windows. All that you have to explore, I said to Mary Carmichael, holding your torch firm in your hand. Giving voice to the accumulation of unrecorded life. This is perhaps the closest that Woolf comes to offering a manifesto for women's writing. It's what Terence Hewitt imagines doing in The Voyage Out, and what Woolf in part attempts to do in many of her own novels, and what she urges her listeners and readers to do in A Room of One's Own. And I wanted to just finish with, with, with two quotes from the essay, in which she's speaking very directly to the student listeners um, uh, uh, at Girton Newham in the, uh, uh, the talks that she's giving, and really trying to stimulate them, to inspire them, to go and write a new history that recognises and listens to and gives voice to the kind of lost lives of women. I've told you in the course of this paper, she says, that Shakespeare had a sister, <laughs> but do not look for her in Sir Sidney, Lives, at Sir Sidney Lee's Life of the Poet. She died young. Alas, she never wrote a word, she lies buried where the omnibuses now stop opposite the Elephant and Castle. Now my belief is that this poet who never wrote a word and was buried at the crossroads still lives. She lives in you and in me and in many other women who are not here tonight for they're washing up the dishes and putting the children to bed. The life of the average Elizabethan woman, she says, must be scattered about somewhere. Could one collect it and make a book of it? And this is what she wants her listeners, those students, to do. It would be ambitious beyond my daring, I thought, looking about the shelves of books that were not there, to suggest to the students of these famous colleges that they should rewrite history. Though I own that it often seems a little queer as it is, unreal, lopsided. But why should they not add a supplement to history, calling it, of course, by some inconspicuous name, so that women might figure there without impropriety. For one often catches a glimpse of them in the lives of the great, whisking away into the background, concealing, I sometimes think, a wink, a laugh, perhaps a tear. I'll finish there, thank you. Um, in the seminars, you're going to be exploring exactly the kind of possibilities of that uh, recovery of um, uh, uh, women's lives within history that, that Wolf is, is talking about. So do enjoy that. But after tea, perhaps later today, make sure you walk on the grass and go into the library because we will let you. Okay, thank you.